Let's do this. So, <clears throat> I talk about that kind of stuff because I care about you. Um, so we were talking about stepper motors. Very brief recap of where we were. Um, DC motor, windings on the rotor in a magnetic field projected by the stator. Stepper motor is reverse. Electromagnets in the stator, the rotor is a permanent magnet. Right? Good. If you activate two of these electromagnets, you get a stronger torque, but everything is thrown off by a 45 degree angle, but it still rotates in 90 degree increments. There are a couple of ways that you can increase the resolution on a stepper motor so that you are rotating in 90 degree increments. One is to increase the number of phases on the stator, that is to say, increase the number of windings. Another way is to increase the number of permanent magnets on the rotor. So, that leaves us about where we were. This, uh, we went through this example. There we go. Good. So, resolution is sometimes given in the number of uh, steps required to complete a full resolution or revolution. So, if we have a two pole motor that takes four steps, that takes four steps. If we have a six pole motor, that takes 12 steps. So the angular resolution of a stepper motor is equal to 360 degrees divided by the number of steps, where the number of steps is the uh, number of poles multiplied by the number of phases. Right? Make sense? This should, uh, that should be fairly intuitive from the, uh, from the manner in which we're adding phases and, and um, poles. Yeah. Good? Good. So, in general, a stepper motor can have more than three phases. In this case, we generalize the formula to n, which is exactly what I just said. Num n times the number of poles. 360 divided by that, that's the resolution. So. so, half stepping, right? The basic idea with half stepping is that we alternate uh, activating two phases and one phase so that, I, I think I already explained this actually, but um, if you have say, a two-phase, two-pole stepper motor, right? If you activate this, uh, turn this guy on, you get north-south, orient this way. If you turn this guy on, boy, no, reverse, sorry, south-north, geez, magnets, how do they work? Um, if you then turn this guy on, right? South, north. This guy in the middle, which I'm going to grab an eraser for, gets pulled into this position here. And you'll see we have stepped 45 degrees despite the fact that we have um, 90, like in theory if we had only activated one of these at a time, you would only have 90 degree increments. But yeah, we have talked about this quite a bit already, so I won't dwell on it too much. So there is one important note here. When you only have one winding activated, you only have the torque available, which is provided by the one winding. So in order to equalize the torque between these different guys, you, um, you basically 
have to increase the current through the coil while you're stepping through uh, one of these single uh, single phase activation steps. Right? Now, you can do that one of two ways. Right? If, you, if you're already providing your maximum rated uh, current through these coils on the two uh, on the two activated phases step, you could um, knock that down to half and then give the full to just the single. Right? That would provide a consistent torque. Um, but in general, um, you know that would still be that would be reducing the torque. Like you can't exceed the maximum current on these uh, coils either, right? Oh, I'm, I'm not actually wearing the thing, am I? Jeez, I'm having too much fun. Alright. All right. Anyway. Does that make sense? Consistent torque isn't a problem if um, whatever application you're using doesn't require as much torque as, be, as is being generated. But once you start getting into those cases where you need more torque than the motor can provide with just a single phase activated, then you start running into problems with half stepping. Test. Hello? Hello? Is this thing on? No. Okay, good. I need like a monitor speaker somewhere. Anyway, so the sequence for half step, half stepping. And you'll notice that we kind of get this zigzaggy pattern going on, right? We're alternating having a single pole on and having two on. So in effect, each one of these um, coils is activated for a continuous three steps, right? But, uh, yeah, so that's the sequence. There you go. So, exercises. Describe the behavior of a six pole stepper motor given the sequence above. Consider the torque the stepper motor produces when using half stepping with one winding components. We've already considered the torque. So, so let's, uh, let's just take this briefly. Not take too much time. But, um, so rather than having the, um, the two pole stepper motor, let's imagine that we have the six pole. So let's start with just this pole activated, right? So V1 will be plus 
the rest will be minus, I'm not going to write the minuses. Going back to our diagram here, the next step for single is to activate these guys, lock this one in, right? But we want to do a half step. So we apply positive here and um, negative here at the same time as those guys, right? So positive here, positive there, negative otherwise. Now we're in this position. Uh, sorry, now we want to activate this position, right? So, A2, A2, nothing else. This is looking familiar, right? So the next one, we want to position halfway between these two guys. So, we turn both of them on. So in that case, B2. while still maintaining A2. Is this beginning to look familiar? Does this look, in fact, pretty much exactly like this one? Except with the... Uh, yeah, right? So, is there... Can we conclude that there's um, any difference? Right. So, there you go. The half-stepping sequence for a six-pole stepper motor is the same as for a regular one. Consider this. Which of the four steps out of the eight would you prefer to use when performing full steps? Does this depend on the application? We've kind of all, this is review questions. Um, when a stepper, when you read a stepper motor's specifications and you see a rated torque, is that using full steps, or half steps, or uh, just using single poles? That would be, yes, full steps. full steps, yes. The rated torque on these motors assumes that two coils are activated, right? So it's the maximum amount of torque that these things can put out. Good. <clears throat> so, so, another thing that we can consider, so far, we have dealt with all of these coils as if they were just simple switches on and off, right? There is either current or there is no current. The question then becomes, what happens if we drive analog signals? Um, that is to say, voltage levels which may vary between 0 and plus 5, or whatever the reference voltage level is. Well, <clears throat> that allows us to control the amount of force, magnetic force, which is exerted by these poles on the rotor allowing us to maybe, you know, let's say this one is activated with 75% strength and this one is activated with 25% strength, right? You would get a position that was mostly in line with this one, you know, 75% in line with that one, and 25% that way, right? So this is called micro-stepping. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily, um, in terms of torque, it's probably not going to give you um, the most torque that you could get. But um, page not bad, lovely. Um, but yeah, does that make sense? Like this is, this is an analog device, and so far we've been using it as if it were a digital device. But uh, we can actually vary the strength of the magnetic electromagnets 
by running uh, you know comparative voltages through it. Good. Yeah. Question. Just based off the geometry of that six pole stepper motor, mm -hmm. are the angles rotated for a half step different than that for a full step? Because it's sixty degrees for a full step by the looks of it. Yeah. Um, well, um, so we start off with this one, and we pull this one into alignment, right? Here. So that one will rotate that much. So I think, believe it's actually 30 degrees. Um, so if you used half stepping on it, then you'd get 15 degree resolution. Make sense? Good. Um, good. Boy, you guys really are like just whacked out, aren't you? You guys are like, this is, this is, yeah. I can, I can feel the energy in the room is like, I don't know how to describe it, but I like, if I were to pick a Mario character for it, it would be a swamp. <laughs> what? That's pretty accurate. Wait, what? <laughs> So, <clears throat> so, okay, this is fine, this is good. So far, we've sort of been talking about the quote-unquote traditional stepper motor, right? Um, it turns out, like, um, anybody, can anybody tell me what the resolution of the stepper motor that comes with your lab kits is? Off the top of your head? No? Anybody got a lab kit with them? Yeah. Is it? Maybe it's maybe it's like written on the thing. The stepper motor. Hmm? Thirty-eight. Forty-eight. Oh, forty-eight steps. Okay. So forty-eight. So 360 divided by 48, 7.5 degree resolution, sound about right? Maybe? So anyway, so this is, this is a little bit technical because, so in order to understand how the, um, uh, what's the switched reluctance motor, stepper motor, works. You have to understand a little bit about uh, magnetic reluctance. Um, how many people know what is meant by the term magnetic reluctance? There we go. <laughs> okay. One person. Two. Okay. So. Oh, two people? People? Okay. Um, again, I think high school is letting all of you down. But um, so, electricity and magnetism are actually the same thing, right? Um, although, you know, of the fundamental forces, we call it electromagnetism, not electricity and magnetism separately. While there was originally a relationship known between electricity and magnetism, the, um, the fact that they were actually the same thing expressed differently was not known um, uh, until the 20th century, I believe. But anyway, so this means that between electricity and magnetism, there are many uh, phenomena which are sort of parallel phenomena, right? In electric circuits, we have resistors, right? A resistor uh, provides some impediment to the flow of electrons through a conductor, right? Thus creating resistance, thus depleting electrical potential energy, right? Electrons always follow the path of least resistance. Lightning, right? <coughs> Magnetic flux will also try to follow the path of least resistance, right? So when you have an electromagnet, 
right? We've all seen these diagrams of like the concentric rings of magnetic flux, right? Hopefully, this is what magnetic flux looks like, right? Magnetism. If you provide a material with um, a lesser degree of magnetic reluctance, which may be thought of in the same way as electric resistance, the magnetic flux will pass mostly through the material with the lowest reluctance. It's like that finding the, most, uh, finding the path of least energy dissipation thing, right? So, for example, if you have an electromagnet here, right, and you um, say you take the ferromagnetic core, which is this guy, the reason, like, the, ferro, the purpose of the ferromagnetic core is because it is a material with a low reluctance to magnetic flux. So you're not dissipating flux inside of the coil itself, or at least dissipating it as, least, as little as possible, right? So if you extend the ferromagnetic core, form a ring with it, right? Most of the magnetic flux will travel through the ferromagnetic core. So much of it will, in fact, that if you put another co if you put another coil on this side, right? Electricity will be generated inside of this coil from the electricity here. Right? The number of coils, uh, the number of windings here, has an, like affects the voltage. So this is actually what a transformer looks like, like a, a power transformer. You know, like uh, those big, um, those big things they have on uh, on telephone poles, right? It's got one of these in them. Like more complicated than this, because this is like the this is like the simplified diagram that you do in class, obviously. But like, yeah, so like. You know, they're pulling, they're pulling, um, you know, voltage on the um, on the power lines. I don't know what it's at. It's probably like in the kilovolts range. Bringing it down to, um, you know, 120 volts for household use, or 240 volts, and then it steps again. At each step, this is this is how voltages are transformed at at that level, right? So that's kind of cool, right? You know, it works with AC and DC. But, um, but yeah, so the ferromagnetism here, it draws the flux into the, the, um, into the core of it. And you can think of basically all of this as becoming magnetized at that point, right? Like, magnetic flux wishing to reduce the amount of uh, low uh, magnetic flux wishing to reduce the amount of high reluctance material it has to travel through is what causes magnetism, magnets to snap together. Right? It exerts force on objects in order to do that. So, okay. So that's fine. That's good. Any questions about reluctance? What's the zone called again? Like, the which? The zone that Oh, um, this is this would be a ferromagnetic material. Okay. Um, most commonly, soft iron is used for this um, because it's 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 a good combination of being a good low reluctance material and it's pretty cheap. So um, uh, iron is I think there I think neodymium works really well for it as well. Uh, neodymium, of course, makes an excellent permanent magnet as well, but. Uh, but yeah, that's like that's. You'll find that most materials that make good permanent magnets will also make good conductors of magnetic flux because, of course, they would because they're magnets. But you know, anyway. So magnets, how do they work? Solved. Um, 
Um, anyway, uh, any other questions about uh, about uh, magnetism before we continue on? Because like that understanding that effect is going to be critical to understanding how the uh, switched reluctance motors work. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, okay. Just one more thing to say about that. Like this is also the effect that like this is why magnets attract like a bunch of different stuff and not just other permanent magnets, right? It's because the mag whatever the material is that is magnetic once it is in uh, proximity to a magnet, it like like a bolt, right? A bolt will stick to a magnet because it's a low reluctance material, right? Whereas you will not stick to the magnet because you're made mostly of water and carbon compounds, and those are not low reluctance materials. Although you can actually, le le uh, you can levitate a person with magnetism if you have a strong enough magnetic field. Because of their blood. Yeah, iron in the blood. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, anyway, so magnetic reluctance or uh, magnetic resistance is a concept used in the analysis of magnetic circuits. That's right, folks. There's a whole field of science called magnetic circuit analysis. It is analogous to resistance in, electric, in an electric circuit, although it does not dissipate magnetic energy. In likeness to the way an electric field causes an electric current to follow the path of least resistance, a magnetic field causes magnetic flux to follow the path uh, the path of least magnetic reluctance. The smaller the, uh, the smaller the air gap between ferromagnetic materials becomes, the lower the magnetic reluctance becomes. Just like air is a very good insulator of um, electric uh, electricity, it's also a good, though less good, blocker of magnetism. So this is what a magnetic reluctance motor looks like. Note, we've got four coils and a core made of a low reluctance material with teeth on it, right? When a coil is activated, it will pull the nearest teeth closest to the, the other teeth that are corresponding on the coil, uh, the, the, the coil core, right? So, the teeth are designed with such an angle and in such a way that, um, boy, they're just going to space all these out, right? Basically, if you start here, right, activate the next one, these teeth pull into alignment, you move an increment, incremental step that way, right? You then activate Magnet three pulls the, those teeth into alignment, and you can you can see that by that you get very small stepping. Um, Makes sense at a conceptual level, at least. Good. So, step one: energizing top coil. Energizing top coil creates a magnetic field that causes the rotor te gear teeth to align with the top stator's teeth to minimize the air gap and reduce magnetic reluctance. Energizing coil one attracts the nearest tooth of the gear-shaped iron rotor. The te with teeth aligned to electromagnetic one, electromagnet one, they will be slightly offset from electromagnet two, the next electromagnet in there. So one thing that's important to note about this, this thing is not a permanent magnet. Oh, uh, yes, question. Hmm. Maybe it would make sense if I like drew a linear diagram that does the same thing as this rotary diagram. Let me try that. So let's imagine that you have um
So, I don't know if this is going to be a useful example, but we'll try it anyway. So let's imagine you have a bunch of um, magnets on a string that will be attracted to these coils as they, um, as they sequentially activate, right? So right now we're in a position where coil 1 is activated. Thus, this guy is, like, imagine these are in a track and they can't move vertically, right? So, this guy is in line, right? Next, we turn this guy off, turn this guy on, right? This force holding this in place goes away. This guy, like, the magnetic flux comes out tries to pull this guy into position and alignment with it. Right? So, in fact, the whole thing moves over by about that much. Right? So that it's in line. That I'm going to do a couple of these. So the whole, like, the whole line is shifting line? Exactly. But not by much. Right? Just like a tiny little bit. Right? Um, but, like, this guy, that brings him into closer alignment with this guy, right? And this guy is in closer alignment with this guy, but he's still a fair ways off, right? So, then you turn this guy off, you turn this one on, right? That pulls this guy into alignment, right? Which means this guy's moving further away. This guy is now quite far away, right? You see the principle? So it's doing the same thing, but doing it on a rotary basis, right? And, um, you know, the magnetic flux is having to travel through the whole thing, right? It's not like rotating. It's not rotating like 360 degrees. Oh, it's, certainly not. Like no. it's, it's very small. Yeah. With this type of motor, Going from position one to position two will give you the uh, the exact angular resolution of the motor, right? It's just a small tick. Uh, question. Um, that distance. So when, uh, like, let's say the first magnet was that um, properly lined up, the one that wants to, right? Like, uh, just, no, sorry, the one that was number one. Um, that distance. So yeah, once that guy's turned off, that distance between the second magnet. And the one that it wants to line up with, mm -hmm. right? That distance that has to move, that be consistent for each step as it moves on. That's what creates like consistent torque for the motor, right? Yes. Okay. So this here, uh, going, um, uh, pardon me, ma'am. Oh. So this distance here would be the analog of your an your angular resolution, right? Because that's the amount that the whole thing moves by being pulled into place. Make sense? Question? Um, so if, if those four are doing that, why do we need all of the other ones? Because um, like, if you think about it, like, the teeth would just keep coming, right? And they would just keep rotating? Yep. So then why do we need the other coils at the bottom to the right and the left? Well, um... <sighs> So I'd, I'd say a couple of reasons. I'm, I'm somewhat speculating here. To me, it makes sense to keep these magnet, these electromagnets, like reasonably far apart from each other, so they're not inducing current in each other when they turn on, right? That'd be one thing. Um, so in that sense, you want them to be spaced quite far apart. The other thing is like, um, you know, this too won't come into alignment with that motor for, like, you know, a rotation of a good, you know, 40 degrees or whatever, right? So you require all of these teeth so that you can get this motion going continuously um, in, like, as it's, as it's spinning. I meant the opposite. I meant, like, so you see, like, the one, two, and three, and four? Yeah. So the, we have one of those at the top, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have another one right to... Uh, yeah, there, and then we have another one, and then we have another one. So why do we need the last three? 
the first one could just do the job with the teeth, the teeth of the quill? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's a problem with this diagram over here. Imagine this with four teeth on the bottom of each of these. Basically, these are the individual coils, not the individual teeth on one coil. Like all of these guys, all of these points are on the same core of the same electromagnet, so they cannot be magnetized independently. Uh, okay. Right? That's why, that's why four coils, so that four of these can be activated independently. Yes? Could you do that with two coils instead of one? Um, yeah, you'd have to adjust the, the angles of the teeth, but yeah. Um, this is like, I know that like, this is not, like, like engineers haven't used slide rules since computers were developed. But this is essentially the principle upon which slide rules work, right? Um, anybody here own a, uh, um, a set of calipers? Yeah, that's, it's, it's the same idea as how calipers work. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, good. So, uh, energizing. Da, 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 da. So, there are 25 teeth on the rotor gear. There are four independent magnets. What is the resulting full step angular resolution? Um, that would be, well, are you going to tell us the formula slides? Um, so it's 3.6. So the answer is 100. So yeah, it's this multiplied by that. Number of teeth multiplied by number of poles gives you, uh, take that and divide 360 by it, and that gives you the angular resolution of this type of motor. So, um, so long as you have, you know, designed the teeth on the coils to actually line up with the teeth on the rotor, in theory, like, how many teeth can you put on a gear? Quite a few, right? It just makes the gear a little bit more expensive, but not that much more expensive, right? Um, so this is a much cheaper way of achieving higher, um, higher angular resolutions than just adding more and more poles to a permanent magnet, right? Make sense? Good. Let me just see here. Yeah, let me let me see if there's anything left worth discussing in this, uh, or is it just an explanation of the explanation that I've given? Yep. There we get the formula. Yep. Oh yeah. Okay. So we have to talk about the, this control circuit. Um, we will talk about the control circuit next time in class. Good luck on the midterm, and uh, see you guys tomorrow. Uh, any of you, uh, any of you that survive, anyway.